once you delve deeply into driverless cars, you can see so many difficult ethical and moral decisions. What we're doing here is making sure that we provide people with the starting point to have these conversations. We understand the implications of the technology we use and of the decisions that we make. We're thrilled to engage both the university community and the broader Ann Arbor community on this issue that is of special relevance to the Metro Detroit area, obviously as the Motor City. Of course, it's relevant everywhere. This is a very transformative technology that will impact everybody's life. The shared automated vehicle system could both save money, save time, and save energy. We're coordinating all the rides. We're, we're making sure there's no congestion, there's no traffic, that everything's energy efficient. But in order to do this, would we have to restrict where human-driven vehicles can go? Maybe they can't go downtown. Maybe they can't go during rush hour. Uh, would we have to restrict personal vehicle ownership? Because the whole basis of this efficient system is shared rides. And if I'm going in my own vehicle, I'm kind of I'm kind of messing up the system a little bit, or maybe I have to pay a premium to use the roadways. What happens to the freedom to wander? This system essentially assumes that you know where you want to go. What if you don't know where you want to go? What if you just want to explore? Is that, is that part of the system? Is that something you can do? Uh, is that a separate service you pay for, the wander the city service? <laughs> this tremendous vision of sustainability is possible, but, but is it at a price we're willing to pay? If it incentivizes more people to buy autonomous cars, that would increase traffic, right? And then that would make the commute times, even if you're an autonomous vehicle, could go up, which could disincentivize even traveling in autonomous cars. So I wonder if there would be some sort of equilibrium where we might think that, we might worry that autonomous cars make more drivers, but insofar as more driver or operators make more traffic, you know, you might, I don't know. I don't know where it would end. I could see, I could see getting pushed in both directions. I think there could be a balance. I'm not sure if more uh, automated vehicles would necessarily mean more drivers, especially if there is the concept of shared yeah. that comes in, which is rapidly becoming a reality. However, if you do want to think about the ethics of it, the number that keeps coming back to mind is 30,000 per year. Those are the number of fatalities every year in this country. Uh, in that 30,000, that's about 4,000 of those are teenagers. The number one cause of death for teenagers in this country are car crashes. 99% of those are preventable. So that's a very horrible number to think about. So would we be uh, willing to trade urban sprawl for that? I don't think it's an either or. I think we can have both. We can have safe cars and have vibrant cities. I don't think we have to choose between the two. Very basically, we need full costs driving. Whatever your externalized costs of driving are, you should be paying for fully, whether they're pollution costs or uh, congestion costs or, or other environmental costs. But my wife is very sick, right? And the only way for me to save her life is to speed and to get her to the hospital faster. What are we going to do with these exceptions, right? Follow traffic laws unless, and now we've got to think about what the unless is supposed to be, and we have to think from a programming perspective how we empower the car to make these sorts of decisions in those contexts. So a sort of standard philosophical chestnut is the trolley problem. Imagine that I'm driving over here from Kalamazoo. Imagine that I am being piloted by, by my autonomous car. And you know, due to very unfortunate circumstances, the car confronts this sort of situation where its programming has to decide whether to hit five pedestrians um, or um, to swerve and crash itself into a telephone pole. Utilitarian approach might be just look at the numbers, right? It's better to kill one person than to kill five people, so the car should swerve and kill the driver. From the car's perspective, a lot of the sort of moral encoding that we would want to do, say, encoding the concept of an emergency, um, or encoding the concept of the greater good, it seems hard, and I'm not a computer programmer, right? But it seems like it, seems like it would be hard to tell a car, right, to think through these sorts of calculations. The car could just have some randomized um, program, uh, and the car just flips this metaphorical coin, 
There seems something attractive about the utilitarian framework. There seems something attractive about the coin flipping framework. But at the same time, we seem deep, deeply uncomfortable with either. But now as a consumer, right, I'm not really sure I want to buy that car, right? I might rather have my own car that I get to decide, right, who lives and who dies. So there might be a tension here, right, between um, sort of our, our egoistic impulses and, and the greater good. We can ask whether the, the programming should be different, right? Maybe the public bus that's owned by the city sh really should tend toward the greater good. Maybe the private car should favor the owner. We ought to be already weighing in on the side of a shared mobility system. I think that policies ought to be form even at this early stage to push towards that kind of vision. I think there will be some people who own their own automated cars, but I think much more likely is we're going to have fleets of shared automated cars. I'm going to make the argument that shared mobility and automation are kind of natural partners, that they're kind of natural and, and I would argue almost inevitable partners. Why is this? The car, uh, you share the cost. You don't, ha you don't necessarily have to pay for the whole car. You can just use the portion of the car that you need. Uh, and, and if we spread that cost, it becomes affordable to more people. We can almost think of these as, as a new kind of transit, as a new form of transit. Um, why are they transit? They're open to the general public. Uh, once we have enough people in these vehicles and they're driven by uh, uh, self-driving, they can be affordable in price, available to people who cannot drive. You don't have to put a drive to use one of these. Um, and you can have both shared vehicles and shared rights. How this information is, is collected, processed, protected, encoded, I mean, all in encrypted, right? Like all of these become now suddenly very important. The system must know whether the driver is well, whether the driver is sleeping or not. So in order to do that, what uh, the industry folks are doing now is they have cameras pointing inside. They want to see the driver. But this brings up the issue of privacy. You don't want cameras pointing at you in the car that the system can see and then potentially be going back to the car company, you know, up in the cloud. Uh, and then, you know, the centralized dispatch system, they know every trip we've taken. And maybe they promise to keep it anonymous, but how do we know they keep it anonymous? What are, what's our guarantee? Who, how, do they know, how do we know they don't sell this data or aggregate the data and sell the data? The worry, right, that if you have these autonomous cars, maybe they, they could be hacked. Maybe the hacking is by nefarious terrorists. Um, maybe it's just criminals who just want to steal the car. But, you know, there's this worry that we could, people could use the car for evil ends, turn the cars into weapons. So on the one hand, we worry about security threats. On the other hand, a lot of the ways that we might absolve the security threats lead to privacy threats. So I look at somewhat like a spectrum, and there's hard decisions to be made. How does this whole move to driverless cars, how does it affect us, the operator, the, the human, the nut behind the wheel? Until we have the top level of automation where we have a 100% self-driving car, 100% of the time, we are still important. 98% of driving is just simple. It's that 2% that really, really matters. And that's, that's what is critical. There is the transfer of control issue, which is basically what happens when the system and the automation self-driving car cannot handle the driving situation and needs the human, the operator, to take control of the steering wheel. Now you take out the control task, the car driving itself, and you're only given a monitoring task. It's the most boring thing to do in the world. Because you're just sitting and you're like, okay, well, I'd rather drive than do that. So very quickly, people start getting bored. They either start nodding off or maybe they start texting. I mean, people are texting nowadays even on non-self-driving cars. You put them in a self-driving car, of course they're going to text. They're texting, they're watching the YouTube video, and then suddenly the car needs to give control back to you. They're not able to respond well enough. And that is an issue. That's actually more dangerous than, you know, being in control and texting. What kind of warnings will you give to the driver? Will you buzz his seat? Will you give an audible tone? Will you, you know, have an alarm ring loudly with you know, three minute warning or whether it be with one second warning. And that's where it gets really dicey. One of the concerns is that a certain class of driver may see a automated car and take advantage of its passive behavior to, to dominate it, to cut it off, to tail it, to, because you know it's not, going to, it's not going to fight back. It's going to be as docile as possible. Even if they look the same, they're behaving differently, which means that we ought to know if that particular car that's tailgating me or that I'm behind will behave like a human would. If not, well, we want to put a big purple beacon on it so that it says it screams automated vehicle. 
there are issues with different driver characteristics. So we have older drivers who may not have the response time to be able to respond quickly enough. They're impaired drivers, people who think that they have a self-driving car, so maybe they can have a drink or two. Uh, they are the inexperienced drivers, the novice drivers. And we actually study novice drivers a lot, the teenagers, because number one, they're really bad drivers. The numbers prove it. Number two, they're obviously inexperienced because they haven't driven much. And if they're in a self-driving car, by virtue of the fact that they're in a self-driving car, they're not gaining any more experience. So why would you give them the wheel if they don't have experience? This brings about questions about policy. Do you, is it necessary for you to be at least 25 years old with five years of driving experience under your belt before you can operate a self-driving car? Does that defeat the purpose then? I think there's about two million people with driving jobs in the United States. In general, when automation replaces workers, which is, which is, you know, we have two forces. We have globalization replacing workers. We have automation replacing workers. What do you do about that? What do you do when there's not enough good jobs uh, for everyone who wants to work? And I think that, to me, I don't think that's a driverless car problem. I think that's a societal problem. Another ethical dimension there is how the costs or the benefits are allocated. The air conditioning company from Indiana moves to Mexico. On the one hand, it looks like everybody wins. Our air conditioners are all cheaper. But but for the city in Indiana that you know now gets shuttered because 5,000 people lose their job. You've got to think through what, what the economics are. But you, know, you also, we, we care about things like lives and, and you know how, how, those, how those costs are distributed is also, I think, ethic, it is ethically important. I mean, they're real. It's, it's cool. It happened. It's, it's, it's going to be here before we know it. I just came to find out more about uh, the ethics of autonomous vehicles, but it ended up being a, such a much, much broader conversation than I was expecting. It was really, really fascinating. So, Thank you. Tonight was great. I didn't know that there were this many people like collaborating on projects like these, and it was good to see um, kind of like bio and ethics working together because I'm a bio person myself. But I thought it was really interesting, and I'm really glad I came. I think it went really great. Um, we were just so lucky to have such a great variety of presenters on so many interesting topics. I thought it was a great discussion. Uh, we covered a lot of stuff that I wanted to cover and stuff I didn't know I wanted to cover, so <laughs> it was all very good. Yeah, I never realized that when I started working for this organization, the impact it would have on the way I consider ordinary issues in my daily life. I've become a much better public speaker because of it. We have a ton of fun on the team uh, approaching these issues, coming up with really creative solutions to ethical problems. I've gotten a lot better at listening to people and trying to take multiple viewpoints on a situation.